When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So, if you look at the ancient town of Nazareth and the, the hillside still there today, it's a rocky outcropping. He was in the synagogue teaching. He unpacks Isaiah's prophecies concerning Messiah. The people have a sudden realization that Jesus is speaking about himself. They get angry. I believe they grabbed hold of him in a crowd. They jostled him to the cliff on the edge of the town, and you can see it today. It drops straight off about 50 feet of rock. And as they were trying to throw him off the side there, I believe miraculously, he passed through their midst. Just like the angels and Lot passed through the midst of the men of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he passes on from there and goes to Capernaum. Capernaum! Do you know what Capernaum means? It means Nahum's village. Nahum or Nahum, the prophet of the old covenant. Nahum's village. Jesus goes to Capernaum. It's a city on the shore of Galilee. It's a center of commerce and fishing. It's a major city of that region. It's Nahum's village. Nahum, the prophet, who'd been carried off in the captivity and exiled the Assyrians. The Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom and their ten tribes and carried them off to the very end of their empire out in Central Asia. And as was their practice, they would pick people up from the other side of the empire and they would move them into this land to disorient them, to tamp down nationalist tendencies, to control the people. And so these people, these foreigners, these Gentiles were brought into this region that becomes Galilee. And they mix in with the Jews who are in that region. And here we have Jesus in Galilee at Capernaum, Nahum's village. Nahum preached against the great power of his day. Nahum, who was in exile and who was powerless, spoke out in his great prophecy, written like a poem, saying that the Lord God is going to bring Assyria down. That Assyria, this great power... This persecuting power will be conquered. And Jesus now comes to Capernaum. Going on verse 14. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Galilee having been seized by the Assyrians, sending the ten northern tribes away. In these intervening centuries, Jewish people are coming back in. They're colonizing the region again. In the days of Jesus, Galilee is about 50% Jewish by this point in time. But Galilee is a safe place for Jesus to pack, unpack his ministry. He's got work to do for three years. He's going to crisscross the region preaching and performing signs away from the power struggles and the danger in Jerusalem. Galilee in Jesus' days was on the fringe of a sea of Gentiles. And I don't believe it's a mistake that Jesus sets up his ministry on the shores of a sea. A sea. Jews understood the picture and motif of the sea in the Old Testament. The sea is always a picture of the Gentile nations. Turbulent Gentiles. Always, always perhaps coming and overthrowing you coming and overthrowing your land. And Jesus is by the Sea of the Galilee on the fringe of the Gentiles. And Jesus is the light of the world and has invaded the province of Galilee. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The invasion has begun. John's message now becomes Jesus' message. Remember, John's at the shore of the Jordan River. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he's arrested. And Jesus picks up that message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as Jesus unpacks his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is among you. The kingdom is among you. And in the death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom has arrived. Friends, you're in the midst of the arrival of the kingdom. You're standing in the midst 
of the kingdom coming and changing and transforming everything. You are soldiers of the kingdom of God, and we are marching toward the eschaton, toward the judgment day, when Jesus will come again to receive his kingdom and make every nation submit to him. So the headquarters of this great invasion force is at Capernaum, Nahum's village. And Nahum said these words. Think about this for a minute. He's in Nahum's village. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. And Nahum 1.15 says, Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news. Who brings good news. Now, when the Old Testament's Hebrew was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, it says, who brings good news. The word good news there is un galizome. It's the same root of euangelizo or euangelizomai. It's the good news. Euangelizo becomes evangel, and then in modern English, it becomes gospel. Gospel, the good news. The good news of what? That Jesus Christ is the Messiah fulfilling the Old Testament. That Jesus Christ has come to bring salvation to his people, and that Jesus Christ and not any Caesar is the Lord of all. We were sitting in a restaurant, the only Asians in the place, when suddenly a whole mess of Chinese college students arrived, taking over all the tables, jumping into the buffet line with as many plates as they could carry. It was an Asian invasion. <laughs> Jesus' arrival in Galilee means that everything is about to change. The gospel of the kingdom was proclaimed everywhere, and the kingdom invasion was breaking in and busting out. So we've seen, first of all, we've seen the first province invaded. Now we're going to see the invasion force expanded. The invasion force expanded. Let's go on to verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left, left their nets and followed him. Now you look at this story, and I've mentioned this in years past here, but I don't know about you, but the first time I read it, I thought they were in some kind of a trance, right? This guy comes along, you know, and I think of it, you know, like modern American terms. We think he's some crazy-looking hippie guy who's eating grape nuts and granola, right? And he says, hey, man, you're fishermen. I'll make you fish as a man. Come on. And they're like, hey, all right, sounds cool. Why would they follow him? Well, they know him. They've been hanging out with Jesus already. How do we know this? We know they're acquainted with him from the accounts that we see in the book of John. And by the way, if you don't know this, you guys should read the Gospels as overlapping accounts. One gospel will give you details, the other gospel won't give. Some of them will have the same event, but give different details. Overlap them. It's good to, to get a parallel Bible as well, so you can see the events and see what's going on in the life of Christ. Back in John chapter 1, verse 40, we see this. Jesus comes to the Jordan to be baptized. John the Baptist has a bunch of followers with him, including these fishermen. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then we pick up the story here in verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So here we've got Peter in the story. And they're fishing back at their hometown. And Jesus, who named him Peter, comes by and calls them, and they follow. I believe Jesus had said, I got some business to do after he was baptized. I got some business out in the wilderness. And he goes over there and gives the devil a beat down. And then he begins to unpack his ministry. Perhaps they all went together to the wedding feast at Cana before this. And then Jesus says, you guys go on ahead. Go to Capernaum, and I'll come and get you. And then we're going to begin. The fishers of men is associated with an invading army. An invading army. This idea of throwing out dragnets. This idea of taking a net and throwing it out and gathering in fish is a motif for gathering in men in the ancient world. Herodotus, 
The great Greek chronicler of history said this about the Persians, that they drag netted the Greek islands. When they came as an invading, conquering force, they threw out a dragnet, as it were, and they gathered up all the people. They gathered them up into their empire. This idea of throwing out nets is associated with gathering people. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16. The people of God have been carried off into various exiles, into the Assyrian Empire and into the Babylonian Empire. And then Jeremiah says this to the exiles in Babylon. Behold, I am sending many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send out many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. The promise of God is you who've been scattered, you who've been in exile, you who've been in internal exile under all these rulers, even in the land of Israel. I'm going to throw out my net. I'm going to send out my fishers. I'm going to gather you back in again to myself. And so it begins. Verse 21. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, his father, mending their nets. And he called to them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. The core of Jesus' invasion force is a special ops team of fishers. Fishers of men. Now he providentially set this up through his word. He providentially, as God, set this up through his word in the past that I will send out fishers of men. And so this is floating around in the atmosphere for centuries among the Israelites. Think about that for a minute. This idea of fishing men has been out there for centuries in the word of God. And then in the providence of God, Jesus calls actual fishermen. Imagine being a fisherman and then coming to the realization of these prophecies of fishing men. Think of what that would mean. You would think, I've been trained all my life with fish because God's going to use this knowledge to go out and fish men, an invasion force of special ops fishermen, an invasion force that's ready to go at a moment's notice. When Jesus comes, they say, time to go. You notice how their father, Zebedee, doesn't say a word? Isn't that weird? Some people have speculated Zebedee went down and was also a disciple of John the Baptist. But whatever the case may be, I assume he's actually a believer of some sort. He found the message compelling. I believe these fishermen were talking about it. How could you not? They'd met Jesus down by the river. John the Baptist had said, this is the Messiah. They're talking about it amongst themselves, waiting for Jesus to come. Zebedee probably knew as well. Zebedee doesn't say, wait, boys, you're leaving the family business. Don't go, you've got family here in town. You've got an inheritance, what are you doing? But Zebedee lets them go because he knows they've been trained to become fishers of men. They're an invasion force that's ready to go at a moment's notice. You should be ready to go at a moment's notice. You're part of a continuing invasion and conquest. You should be ready when Jesus calls you, when Jesus calls you to open up your mouth and to preach the gospel to your neighbors. When Jesus calls you to begin to do some ministry or even some mundane task for the glory of God with your hands and feet, when you hear the voice of God, you need to go at a moment's notice. Verse 23, and they went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus invades the synagogues with the proclamation of the gospel. The kingdom has arrived. And the old parasite king is being thrown out. Notice here that it says that he's engaging in these acts. These are signs, samion in the Greek. Jesus isn't just simply performing random miracles. Jesus is performing signs that show that he's the king and that the kingdom has arrived. These signs point to the reality and the vindication of who Jesus is. He's healing every disease and every affliction. And if you think about it, every disease and every affliction traces its root back to Satan. Satan tempted, and we fell. And with that came death and disease and frustration. And so we see that Jesus healing every disease and every affliction is casting Satan out. Jesus is throwing Satan out. 
of the kingdom of God. Galilee needed invasion and liberation. Galilee needed invasion and liberation, and the world today needs invasion and liberation. And you are invaders, part of a now huge invading force, singing our songs as we go into battle, liberating the world from Satan's parasite kingdom as we follow our warrior king, Jesus. Can I hear an amen to that? We need to get busy this week. We get done here feasting. We got work to do outside those doors. We got work spreading the kingdom of God. The invading Japanese had rapidly seized most of the Philippines in World War II, and now they were closing in on the last American outpost when their commander, General Douglas MacArthur, escaped in a small boat in the middle of the night. His message to the Philippine people and the Americans held prisoner under the cruel occupation of the Empire of Japan was I shall return. Three years later, at the head of a victorious invading force, MacArthur kept his promise and returned. The invading parasite kingdom of Satan made broken and willing subjects out of the rebel sons and daughters of Adam. Through the cruel occupation of the world, the human race had the seemingly small promise of God that Adam would come again. I shall return. The promise was kept, and beginning 2,000 years ago, at the head of an ever-increasingly victorious invading force, the last Adam has been leading his kingdom from victory to victory. Jesus has come, and heavens come with him, because you're in the midst of kingdom invasion. Solideo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us even this morning. We pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit. Make us fit warriors of the kingdom to carry your light into every crack and corner of our community. Bless us to understand and believe these words, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.